Good evening, everybody. It's great to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm Janice Kamenu Resnick, and I welcome you tonight on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice, as well as from Community Advocates Inc., the joint sponsors of this program. And I know the list of co-sponsors, and we thank them all for participating. Uh, our leadership team is Zevier Oslovsky, Mel Levine, Caroline Kelly, Rabbi Ken Chazen, and David Lehrer, and we're all volunteers and we're glad that you appreciate the time we spend, uh, and we know you appreciate it because you come each week. So thank you so much. I want to remind you about next week when we will welcome Congressman Jamie Raskin, the second Trump impeachment, impeachment manager, and the wonderful Rick Hassan, one of the country's top election law experts, who will be in conversation with the New Yorker's Jane Mayer uh, to talk about the state of our union. And the following week, we will welcome former chair of the Joint Chiefs, Mike Michael Mullen, uh, these will be fantastic programs. Please register early. As we move towards July 4th this week, it may seem corny, but it is a perfect time to reflect on the preciousness of our democracy. My late rabbi, Harold Schulweis, taught me the notion which he called predicate theology, meaning that, when, that we should see God as a verb rather than as a noun. In short, he taught, don't fret about what God is, whether God exists or about believing in God. Rather, he said, do God or be godly. I feel the same philosophy applies to our democracy. If we see our democracy as a verb requiring our active participation and engagement, we will then embrace our responsibility to actively pursue our democracy. And yes, that is a tall order. As Robert Kennedy reminded us, democracy is messy and it's hard, it's never easy. So, Happy Independence Day to everyone. Let's continue this pursuit of democracy together. And thank you to Congressman Liu and Professor Ballou for helping, and of course to Larry Mantle, for helping us struggle with our democracy by discussing this very complex issue of extremism and our military. Now to my friend and colleague, the terrific David Lehrer. Thank you, Janice. It's great to be here again at our America to Crossroads virtual town hall. Our talk, a topic tonight has become a headliner in ways we never expected when we invited our speakers months ago, from statements of the Secretary of Defense just a few days ago, to the Washington Post article yesterday, to countless stories in countless publications. There is an emerging realization that veterans and military folks are playing an outsized role in the extremist groups that staged the January 6th Capitol insurrection and related outrages around the country. In fact, 20% of those arrest, arrested related to the January 6th events, our veterans. We'll explore this troubling issue with two terrific panelists and as usual, the very best and moderators. I wanna let you know about some exciting new programs coming up in July. We have Bob Shrum and Mike Murphy, two of the smartest, wittiest and most incisive political analysts on the Republican and Democratic scenes. They will look at where we are nearly six months after the Biden administration took office. What are the implications for 2022 and 2024? They both have storied resumes of campaigners run, and both are at the USC Center for the Political Future. They'll be with us on July 28th. On July 21st, the prior week, we'll have New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Brett Stevens joining us again with a New York Times colleague examining the long-term implications of the COVID year on our economy, on our politics, and on our lives. It's now my pleasure to introduce a decades-long friend, a member of the JUGJ Executive Committee, and a former congressman who represented much of the same area as one of our guests tonight, Mel Levine. Mel? Thanks, David. Uh, and thank you and Janice for your ongoing leadership uh, on all of these issues. And I also thank my dear friend, Zev Yaroslavsky. It's a real pleasure to work with the three of you on these programs. And David, you've laid out, I think, very well. And Janice has too, in the context of our democracy, the stakes that are involved in the subjects that um, Congressman Liu and uh, Professor Ballou will be talking about. It's a real pleasure to introduce them and Larry Mantle. Uh, Congressman Ted Liu is in his third term representing California's 33rd Congressional District. He sits on both the House Committees on the Judiciary and on Foreign Affairs. As I think about it, Ted, um, I spent a lot of time on both of those committees myself, and you are a very worthy successor. Um, he is a former active duty officer in the US Air Force, where, we, where he served in the JAG Corps. He currently serves as a colonel in the reserves. 
Congressman Liu has received numerous medals for his outstanding military service, including the Air Force Humanitarian Service Medal and multiple meritorious service medals. In a short period of time, Congressman Liu has earned a reputation as an effective, respected, articulate representative. He was selected uh, as an impeachment manager in the second impeachment of Donald Trump. His background, talent, and experience uniquely qualify him for this evening's extremely important discussion. Professor Kathleen Ballou is a research fellow at Stanford University and a professor of history at the University of Chicago. She's an international authority on the white power movement. She is the author of Bring the War Home, The White Power Movement and Paramilitary America, and the forthcoming books, Home at the uh, End of the World, I Hate at, uh, Home at the End of the World, A History of the Present, and a Field Guide to the History of Hate. Uh, pretty significant, weighty, and timely subjects. Dr. Ballou was a distinguished scholar, scholar in the field of comparative history of ideas and earned both her MA and PhD in American studies at Yale University. Uh, her current focus of research is race, racism, the white power movement and militarism in 20th century America. And Larry Mantle, as I don't need to remind this audience is a legend in Southern California he has been host of Air Talk, a call-in radio show on KP, KPCC, our local NPR station for decades. Air Talk is the longest running daily talk show in Southern California. Larry has also received numerous awards for his journalism and is one of our most popular moderators. And with that, Larry, I turn it over to you. Mel, thank you so much, Janice, David, and Zev. It is such a pleasure to work with judge and community advocates on each of these programs. And I've been talking with colleagues and acquaintances who've been doing other virtual programs during this year plus of the pandemic. And uh, hearing about the success of these programs and the fact that the audience continues to tune in week after week for these conversations is a great testament to the kinds of guests and the topics that you're able to bring to these vital conversations of America at a crossroads. It's very clear how this format is going to be able to continue for many months on, if, if not uh, far into the future, given the kinds of guests that you're able to bring together who you wouldn't be able to get in the same physical space for an in-person event. So it's a real pleasure for me. This conversation of particular interest to me because in 36 years of hosting Air Talk, I talked about so many different topics multiple times, but when it comes to white supremacy, extremist ideology, and links with the military, that's something that we've not dealt with as much over the years, and I'm really looking forward to learning a lot, as all of us are during the course of this one-hour conversation. So uh, let's start uh, right away. Congressman Liu, as uh, a former JAG during those years, as, as Mel Levine was mentioning, did you encounter cases back then that were linked to extremist ideology or white supremacist thinking? Uh, thank you, Larry, for that question. Uh, let me first uh, thank Janice and David and Zev for your, their leadership. And I'm so honored to be on this panel uh, with you, Larry, as well with, with Professor Ballou. And thank you, Mel, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, in terms of your question, when I was in the active duty military uh, in the 1990s, uh, I did not encounter white nationalism, um, as you describe it. And I just want to note that I agree that there is a issue and there definitely is a problem. I'm glad the Secretary of Defense is looking into it. At the same time, I do want to note that based on the Military Times poll prior to uh, the election last year, the active duty military actually supported Joe Biden over Donald Trump. So I don't want to sort of blow, out, blow the, their issue out of proportion, but I thought it was important to at least put that fact in. All right. Uh, and as someone who is familiar with military culture, at least with, with the Air Force, can you speak to 
how for for some who are serving in the military that this kind of extremist ideology might have some degree of appeal uh, or or after they've served and, and looking for something in their lives, how this kind of messaging might be appealing to them. Uh, before the first election of Donald Trump, I remember going to uh, an event and I met with a professor who studied authoritarianism. And she said something interesting, which is approximately a third of people uh, in various countries tend to have authoritarian tendencies. And it also turned out that when they did surveys, one of the best predictors of whether someone, someone supported the former president was whether they had authoritarian tendencies. And you also see that may be partly the reason why you see more veterans who were in the January 6th do have folks who uh, tend to um, have some authoritarian tendencies also view the military as a place uh, that sort of fits within their, their mindset because it is a more rigid sort of top-down organization. There's not a lot of gray area happening, right? In the military, it's pretty uh, black and white. There are rules, you follow these rules, you take orders from the top. And so that could explain uh, some of uh, why we're seeing some disproportional numbers of veterans who were in uh, the January 6th insurrection. And we'll get to some more of the potential psychological issues, but but Professor Ballou, uh, current and former service members, as the Congressman just saying, are under investigation for participating in the attack on the US Capitol. The Defense Department is reviewing its policies on extremism. Uh, it knows the research that right-wing extremists are responsible for more deaths than any other extremist group. Uh, and that there is this affinity with the military. And I wonder if you can um, talk a little bit more about this historically, because I know in your research, you cite the Vietnam War as having a very central role in, in the growth of this. Yes. So let me, uh, so first, let me just add my thanks for the beautiful introductions. And I'm so honored to be here with all of you. And thank you to the congressman and um, to Larry for, for doing the panel, and I will name everyone uh, individually later, uh, but I want to answer the question. The Let's set out some terms. So um, I think it might help to approach this from the other direction, because what we're talking about is not a story about our veterans or our active duty troops. We're, we're talking about a very, very small percentage of people within those communities. So if we want to look at something like what is the impact of the Vietnam War on the people who fought there? We're not going to come away with the answer that the impact is the creation of the white power movement. But if we wanna look at how did we form the white power movement, a very, very, very small percentage of our service members did find their way into those groups. And when they did, they had enormous impact because they brought with them a narrative about betrayal by the government, a sense of um, urgency and emergency, um, and also a great deal of weapons expertise, munitions expertise, um, training and tactics that then flowed into our civilian spaces. So now this is not unique to our present moment or to the Vietnam War moment. If we wanna look at rises and falls in something like Ku Klux Klan membership over the long life of that organization from the late 1800s to the present, the best predictor for rises in Klan membership is not poverty or immigration or advances by people of color, the best predictor is the aftermath of warfare. But one sociologist has gone and looked at that number and found that that's not all about veterans at all. All of us become more violent in the aftermath of warfare. That, but that number goes across men and women, people who did and did not serve, goes across age group. So what it is, is that there's this opportunism, right? There's the moment of opportunity in the aftermath of warfare when these groups are able to capitalize on the frustrations and sort of the, the violent skill sets in order to dramatically escalate their capacity to recruit and radicalize. That's what's going on. So I think it might help if we turn the question a bit and look at how this works as a social movement that uses particular uh, recruitment strategies with veterans and active duty troops, rather than a problem that's isolated within our armed forces. Well, I, I wonder though, you know, for, for Vietnam veterans, who served in the 60s and 70s, for, for many of the, the white uh, draftees, 
this might have been the first time that they had exposure to African Americans or Latinos, given the heavily segregated America of the 60s and early 70s, the war years. And I wonder if that could have any effect on some of the hostilities post-war that some subset of those who served in Vietnam carried into civilian life. Absolutely. And so we do see profound racial segregation on posts and bases during the Vietnam era. So for instance, um, people hung Confederate flags in their hooches in the Vietnam um, uh, in, in country. So in Kuchi, for instance, um, there were bases that were still heavily segregated despite the order to integrate. Um, and there was a lot of racial animus between people um, in Vietnam and afterward. And um, those of you in Southern California might remember the raising um, of, of issues in Camp Pendleton in 1976 around Klan activity on base, um, which then transformed into continued white power recruitment activity in Southern California through um, Tom Metzger's group with White Aryan Resistance and other local, local groups that you might have read about. Um, but one of the things to remember here is that this kind of engagement of the Vietnam War was not limited to people who fought. Um, and a whole bunch of these activists were simply people who put on the uniform after um, the war was over in order to participate in this paramilitary movement. So we see women putting on camo fatigues as part of Klan membership in the 80s. We see people sewing um, robes and hoods out of camo fatigue material. So we're talking about not just a one-to-one -one problem, but also the cultural overflow and the overflow of weapons and tactics. And what what is the strategy on the part of, of many of these white supremacist groups in uh, recruiting people, either active duty or veterans. What does that give in the way of cachet and actual training experiences that benefit these groups? Yeah, absolutely. So let me stop and define some terms for a second. When I say white power, I'm talking about a social movement that brought together an incredibly broad array of groups and people in the late 1970s and into the 80s including Klansmen, neo-Nazis, militiamen, skinheads, um, some radical tax resistors, some followers of Christian identity, and some other groups like that into one broad-based social movement. Um, that groundswell of people has been carrying out targeted recruitment drives meant to grab um, veterans and active duty troops since at least the late 1970s. That includes membership drives at Fort Bragg and Camp Pendleton. That includes paramilitary training facilities near Fort Bragg and Fort Hood and Camp Lejeune. Um, it also includes obtaining tons, and I mean literal tons, of weapons stolen from the Fort Bragg Armory for use by these groups to wage war on the federal government. And it includes um, the use of these paramilitary operations to instrumentalize acts of violence. So we should also be thinking about Timothy McVeigh, who was a, a veteran of the Gulf War um, and also deeply involved in the white power movement before his bombing of the Oklahoma City uh, building in 1995. Congressman Liu, as, as we look at the aftermath of the attack on the US Capitol and the insurrection there on January 6th, we had the passage of the um, democratically sponsored review uh, in the House of Representatives to look at at the insurrection there. Um, but but what do you hope that that uh, gleans in the way of understanding uh, not just about what happened with the the Capitol Police being overwhelmed, but about the planning that went into it? Uh, that's a great question. Let me just say something about what uh, Professor Ballou's research shows, because it's fascinating and interesting. When you look at polling on veterans last year, uh, it turns out that there's a split and the older veterans supported the former president, but the younger ones did not. And it could also be because the younger veterans, uh, a lot of them just had a lot less war experience or combat experience. There was no draft. Um, and uh, it could be explained by exactly what Professor Ballou said. So I, I find that uh, just fascinating. Uh, in terms of your question, I'm very pleased that the House of Representatives today did pass a select committee to investigate January 6th, to okay. find out what led to January 6th, what happened on January 6th, and the consequences of the January 6th insurrection. And for you know months, the Republicans try to stop either a bipartisan commission from happening, they try to stop this select committee from happening, 
Uh, but we voted, and unfortunately, most Republicans voted no, but two did vote yes. And we're going to have this committee. It's going to be composed of uh, 13 members. The Republican leader will recommend five. Ultimately, the speaker will choose all 13 members. It will have subpoena power, and it will be modeled on prior select committees. And we want to find out not just, for example, why did the former president um, wait so long before actually calling in reinforcements on January 6th. We also want to find out about their advanced planning, as you mentioned, prior to January 6th. What did some of these white supremacist groups uh, put out there in terms of their social media chatter? What uh, did they do in terms of um, planning actual attacks on the Capitol, what they would do once they entered the Capitol? And what did law enforcement know about that? Uh, Professor Ballou, you, you're critical of the uh, lone wolf narrative for uh, far right attacks. And I wonder if you could elaborate on why that is, because it, it seems like just from my memory that in many of these instances we hear, oh, well, they were in contact with other people or on social media, they, they engaged in uh, conversations with people on the far right, but that there wasn't necessarily planning with other people who held similar ideological views. So can you speak a bit to that in terms of the, or the what the degree of organization is and the degree of individual actors? Absolutely. So the phrase lone wolf was created by people in the white power movement in order to distract from the fact that they are a social movement. And that move came with a strategy called leaderless resistance, which is really recognizable to us now because it's pretty much the same thing as cell style terrorism as we know it after 9-11. The idea is that one or a few people will work independently without direct communication with other cells and without direct communication with leadership, but towards a determined set of objectives that the movement has agreed upon mostly. Um, now that happened in 1983. Right? So this has been going for a very long time. This predates um, things like ISIS and Al-Qaeda by quite a bit. We have this backward in our pop popular discourse a lot of the time. Um, these activists pioneered the strategy mostly because they were frustrated with um, FBI infiltration of their groups during the civil rights era and because they wanted to make it more difficult to prosecute them in court. And it leaderless resistance did do both of those things. It made both of those things more difficult. But the bigger consequence of that strategy and of this idea of the lone wolf has been that we really lost public understanding of what this movement was. So for instance, we get to the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. That is the largest deliberate mass casualty event on American soil between Pearl Harbor and 9-11. But most people have no idea that that was part of a social movement. Most people think about that as the work of one person or maybe a few bad apples and don't think about the very deep and wide ties and ideologies that prop propelled that violence. Now, we, um, we, we have extensive information about those ties. This is a full chapter of my book. I'm happy to tell you more about McVeigh's involvement with the movement if you would like in Q&A or you can go and read that chapter. Um, it's too long to do here for you in full, but um, the, the short answer here is just that what we get from the lone wolf narrative is this idea about January 6th perhaps being an isolated event, or perhaps we think of the Tree of Life shooting as anti-Semitic violence, the El Paso shooting as anti-immigrant violence, the Christchurch shooting as anti-Islamic violence, um, the Charleston shooting as anti-Black violence. They are all of those things, right? Those are particular categories of hatred with their own histories, but those actions were all carried out by gunmen who share the same ideology, use the same symbols, cite each other's manifestos, and in many cases have direct ties with one another. And they're part of the same movement that gives us public facing groups like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, and gives us paramilitary groups like Adam Waffen and the base. Now, in real time, it's very hard to connect all of those things. But the more we accept the idea of the lone wolf, the less we do as a society in the important work of putting the pieces together so that we can respond not to any one part of this, but to the groundswell which is the thing that threatens our citizens and threatens our democracy. Uh, Professor, can we talk about some of the groups because many of us have heard the names but don't know how they differentiate from each other even though there uh, may well be an overarching ideology. So, so give us just a few of the most significant uh, groups here. 
Sure. So um, when we're thinking about January 6th, I think the two standouts are the Proud Boys, um, which is a, a, a group that has said over and over publicly that they are not a white power group, but have been flashing white power hand signals, telling journalists to read white power materials and have been um, pursuing activism along a white power playbook. Um, and the Oath Keepers, which is a group that specifically does target uh, active duty troops, veterans, and former police, or perhaps current and former police, um, in order to create a paramilitary strike force that is targeted against the deep state. Now, um, the Oath Keepers, we would categorize perhaps more precisely as militia than white power, but there is enough through line that they should both be treated as part of sort of the same militant right social problem, which is to say both of them are pursuing extra legal activity. All 50 states have laws against using a militia to keep order or to um, uh, to function as a private army. Um, and they're both posing um, imminent threat to the workings of our democracy. Um, so th there's enough information there for us to treat these as part of the same social movement. The other thing that's important to know is just from the history, one thing that is very clear from the earlier period that I study is that people have spent a tremendous amount of energy trying to sort these these activists into groups, right? How many are skinheads? How many are Klansmen? How many are neo-Nazis? Which slogans go with which one? Which one has headquarters in which place? Which, which leader is affiliated with which one? There are really good reasons why that's the first step for understanding what this is. But the thing is that on the ground, that's not how it works. People move between these groups with staggering regularity. And for reasons ranging from having a fight with one person and moving to a different group over here to perhaps a romantic relationship with somebody over there, or maybe you just moved to another town and there isn't a chapter of the one you were in. And so you find this other thing. Um, it's very common for people to have multiple memberships and for them to circulate throughout the course of their lives. That's one thing that the history can show us about this. And Professor, the older groups that we remember from way back, Aryan Nations being yeah. one, the skinheads, uh, the Klan, obviously, are these organizations larger now, do you think, than they were, say, a decade ago? So that is a really good question, and I'm not sure that I am able to answer it for you. I'm also not sure that anybody is able to answer it for you because of the way that we've been counting. Um, the FBI has had sort of a different degree of priority around this over the years, as we see. Um, only just recently in the last year have we finally gotten the threat assessment that the DHS tried to put out last spring and was delayed um, over and over again until October by the Trump administration. That threat assessment says that white extremist violence poses the greatest terrorist threat to the nation. Um, that happened under the Trump administration, not under the Biden administration, just so we're all clear. Um, and the FBI has said that too. So right now there's a ton of resources and, and will directed at this problem. I think that's great. But for many, many years, our attention was elsewhere. Um, there are reasons ranging from um, in the 60s, the FBI was more interested in disrupting activism um, among leftist groups of color. Um, after 9-11, we were understandably much more interested in disrupting um, radical Islam um, and, and jihadist groups. Um, but now our focus is here. So because of that unevenness, um, there's really not been a consistent counting mechanism over time. So I think it's very difficult to get reliable numbers. That said, I think that um, there is a tremendous amount of momentum and activity right now that was not the case earlier. And I think that these activists have found inroads into our mainstream politics that were not available in the 1980s or 90s. Congressman Liu, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting on your attorney hat for a, for a moment, domestic uh, terrorism or, or people with extreme ideologies seeking to overthrow the government uh, do pose some challenges that international terrorism uh, doesn't have to the same degree, and that is constitutional protections for Americans when it comes to surveillance and, and uh, constitutionally protected speech, even speech that is, is highly unpopular and deeply offensive. Um, so what do you see it as, as, as some of the limits that the federal government has in, in tracking and, and potentially heading off attacks? That's a great question, Larry. If you're trying to track a foreign national in a foreign country, 
you don't need a warrant. Uh, the United States has immense surveillance capabilities and we deploy them and, and use them to do that kind of surveillance and tracking. If it's an American citizen in the US, you're gonna need a warrant uh, to do uh, a lot of uh, the surveillance you wanna do in any um, sorts of law enforcement tools are much more limited if you don't have a warrant. And you're right, that does make it harder uh, for law enforcement. I do want to just know that the FBI director again reaffirmed at a recent Judiciary Committee hearing uh, that we had earlier this year that of domestic terrorism, white nationalist terrorism continues to be the most lethal and the most uh, that they're concerned about. And they do have to respect uh, the Constitution. So he also did mention that they can't just start following someone um, because they don't like what that person says. Um, they, they sort of need a factual predicate to think they're going to commit some sort of crime. And so there are certain um, First Amendment protections they have, uh, Fourth Amendment protections that they just make it more difficult uh, to either track or monitor or try to take down white nationalist groups. Well, and then speaking of the military, because we are uh, a little bit more uh, explicitly focused on that this evening, then how does the how does the military itself, which is it, which is in a sense a governmental employer, uh, to deal with this? There are certain speech protections, but also things as a member of the military you can't necessarily do that. You know, someone who's a civilian has the right to do. So, to what degree are military leaders limited in what they can do with personnel who might be targets of recruitment and uh, or engaging in concerning speech or social media communication and what things can they do? Uh, the military actually does have a lot more authority um, to discipline members who uh, do engage in, in acts that the military believes they shouldn't engage in. So there, for example, um, I'm a uh, JAG, and I did court martials. And there is a charge within the Uniform Code of Military Justice for conduct unbecoming. And the military can, in fact, impose a fair amount of discipline uh, in a way that other organizations cannot. So I, I am very pleased, for example, that General Milley um, said what he said at a recent congressional hearing. He uh, did mention white rage, and he understands that that's a problem. You have the Secretary of Defense who sees the problem of extremism. And so military can, in fact, do a lot to try to prevent this from happening. They do have the authority and the tools to do so, because when you sign up for the military, uh, you're signing up also for the Uniform Code of Military Justice that, that just has a lot of things in there that private sector civilians don't have to comply with. I was reading an op-ed that you wrote not long ago, Professor Ballou, in which you were really making a public appeal that sort of all of us have, have a role, a defense of democracy that we undertake in this process. And can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because those of us who don't have direct connection to the military um, don't know anybody who fits the profile of someone who would be uh, in a white power movement. What can we do? Thank you for that question. This is really important because this is not just a problem that operates in one part of our society. This is not just a problem in the armed forces. We need to also think about how this lives in our local communities and a whole lot of other places. My guess is that every American teenager has at this point seen some piece of white power rhetoric on the internet somewhere. Um, we are, I, I get these emails from high school librarians and teachers and parents wondering what they can do about de-radicalization in their own communities, what they do when they see kids going down this path. Um, and we really don't have resources for those kids in a lot of communities. So there's local level work people can do in almost every case to begin to address this issue. And I mean, another thing to think about is that we, um, the United States is not alone in its history of racial injustice and racial violence. There are many nations in the world that have racial injustice, racial and uh, violence, anti-Semitism, and other histories of deep, deep wrong. But we are somewhat alone in how little we have done the public work of having a conversation about that shared past. Um, we have not had anything like a national truth and reconciliation process. I think uh, how difficult it is to get a commission even to investigate January 6th 
which happened very, very recently and which we saw unfold. I, um, I can only imagine, um, Congressman, what that day was like for you. I, I, um, the fact that we have such a contentious memory, even of things that are very, very recent, shows that we really need to do that work of having the public conversation. I think that even something like Make America Great Again is at heart, a, it, it's an argument about history and who we are and where we come from. And I think that engaging at that level has a profound civic power. Let's, uh, let's take a few uh, audience questions and then we can continue with some of the themes that we've introduced to this point. Uh, Pete, I don't know where Pete is from, but he asks, doesn't the increased presence of minorities in the armed services militate against the spread of hate in the military? Congressman? I think by and large, uh, that's correct. I, I, again, if you sort of look at the current active duty military, um, it's clearly not perfect, but it, it does a pretty good job on race relations. Um, and one reason is when you're in the military, they do a lot to train you uh, to not think about race. Uh, they do a lot to make you think about your mission. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, when I'm on a military base, if I see another human being, my first thought is, are they civilian or are they military? And then my second thought is, okay, if they're military, uh, what branch of service are they in? And then my third thought is, if we're outside, all right, um, are they higher ranking than me or lower ranking than me? And do I salute them? Or do they salute me? And, and so you, your mind goes through all these processes uh, and race just doesn't sort of factor into it most of the time. Uh, so people didn't really view me, for example, as the Asian American captain. Uh, I happen to be you know, the captain that did so-and-so or the captain responsible for this mission or that. Um, so that's sort of, my experience, it doesn't mean you don't have racism. Clearly you do, just like in any place else. But in terms of what the questioner said, there are a, a number of minorities in the military and a number of them have risen through the ranks and become generals and so on. You still see underrepresentations you do in many organizations, but in general, the military is, is not bad uh, when it comes to race. Professor Ballou, any thoughts on that? Um, I agree with that. I think that we're talking about a very, very small percentage of the full population of our service members um, and veteran communities too. And I think that in many measures, the military has done an extraordinary job um, at providing for its people with its infrastructure. So there's new work that says that the military, after adjusting for higher rates of exposure to um, combat injuries that elevate rates of PTSD and TBI, for instance, the military um, does a much better job than society at large at providing mental health care. The military does an amazing job at providing um, things like housing and other kinds of things um, for infrastructure for, for its people. I think that what we need to think about is how to leverage what the military already does really, really well for this particular issue. Um, and I think things like adding civics instructions and history instruction might be an, another place to start. But I think that you're absolutely right that in general, this is working okay. The problem is the very small number of people who are taking an oath of induction that says they will protect the constitution while they are part of a movement that says they are trying to overthrow the country. I think we can all agree that that has no place in our armed services. Also, we think of today's military as having uh, higher levels of education than those in the past. And uh, I tend to think of, of the people involved with these groups of having lower uh, amounts of education. Professor, is, is that generally true? So the interesting thing is that that's not necessarily true. And again, we don't have enough of a it's hard to make any kind of sort of quantitative conclusion about the white power movement just because we don't have an accurate counting mechanism that's consistent over time. But there are people in the movement um, that, that I've closely studied who are um, holders of PhDs and aerospace engineers and nuclear weapons specialists. Um, there are also people who are religious leaders alongside people who are high school dropouts and felons. It is really, I, I think it's helpful to think of this as a fringe movement that is relatively small, but incredibly diverse in every way but race. It brings together people across every region of the country, across rural, urban, and suburban space, across gender, um, across 
those who didn't didn't serve. Um, and it's incredibly opportunistic. So it capitalizes on local tension in order to recruit and radicalize. Well, and so you Mary, I just want to oh, add to that yourself. real quick. Uh, the Washington Post published an interesting article where a professor studied the people who were charged and arrested uh, in January 6th insurrection. And it turned out that one of the better predictors was did the county in which they live have a decline in the white population? And so if their county had a significant decline in the white population, essentially meaning more minorities had actually moved in, that was actually a, a really pretty good predictor of whether they were going to be charged or convicted uh, on January 6th or in part of the insurrection. And of course, we, we need to say just statistically, there are undoubtedly many more counties in the nation where there's a decline in white population and no one ended up um, mounting an insurrection. So, but it is interesting that of those arrested, Correct. that that's, that's what they found. And you were mentioning, Professor, about women in the movement as well, many of whom don't have military experience, but we had the case here in Southern California of the Ocean Beach resident in San Diego, uh, Ashley Babbitt. 35 year old Air Force veteran who was shot and killed by Capitol Police officers. She tried to get into the speaker's lobby right outside the, the House chamber. So, um, yeah. And, have, and Ashley Babbitt, um, from the materials that I've seen that are publicly available, seems to have been more deeply tied to QAnon. Um, I haven't seen evidence of her being directly involved in white power activism, although I'm not privy to a lot of what's going on. And I'm a historian, so I'm sitting over here reading the news stories that everyone else is. Um, but I, I think that what was really striking to me about that particular incident is that when she was marching from um, the ellipse to the Capitol building, there's video footage of her describing the protesters as boots on the ground, meaning, you know, combat troops, like they're part of a groundswell here. They're part of a exercise or a deployment. Um, and that I think is very consistent with how a lot of the activists that I study in the 80s thought about what they were doing and talked about what they were doing. All right. Again, we're taking your questions. If you have a question that just comes to mind, please put it in the Q&A and uh, we'll have a chance to uh, at least hopefully look at it. We have more that we can ask, but always love to have more. Please put your first name and where you're viewing tonight's America's at a crossroads. So we have a sense of the breadth of our audience. Um, Rochelle asks, do domestic extremist groups have ties to overseas bigots? Professor? Yes, they do. And they have been developing transnational networks since at least the late 1980s. Um, and that has, of course, just accelerated in the age of the internet. And while we're here talking about transnational communication, it's worth remembering that these groups have been using the internet since 1983-84 with proto-internet computer message boards. Um, so they are not only um, sort of uh, proficient at using social media, but they've been using social network activism since long before most of us encountered it. Um, this has just exponentially increased their reach. Um, and we do see things like circulation of activists um, to other countries where there is um, on the ground fighting. We do see um, circulations of, po of political relationships um, between activists in the United States and authoritarian regimes elsewhere. Well, yeah, and yeah, you kind of anticipate the next question, which comes from Anna, which is the role of social media. Can you elaborate a bit specifically on media? Because I don't know whether there's specific sort of military focused social media platforms or sites where there's an opportunity for these groups to gain a foothold with, with some of the troops. I don't know the answer to the last part of that. Congressman, would you like to step in? Well, it is clear to me that media in general has had a role in having more extremist views. So when we were growing up, right, we would see, you know, Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings and three major news networks all sort of moderate, self-moderated. But now if you're liberal, you'll tend to watch MSNBC. If you're a conservative, you'll watch Fox. If you're really radical, you'll watch like OAN or something like that. But if you watch those networks and the shows, um, there are different realities, different facts are presented to you, um, completely uh, different views of the world. I'll give you one example. When I was uh, doing the second impeachment, by the way, I still think it's weird that we have to specify which impeachment it was of the same person. But anyway, it's the second impeachment. The House impeachment managers, we were in this room um, 
where we had a bunch of TVs going on. And so we had Fox, CNN, MSNBC. And I remember it was prime time. Uh, one of the segments that we were presenting was pretty important. It was sort of the video of the attack on the Capitol. It was one that had a lot of police being brutalized. And Fox basically just cut away from it. And Fox went ahead and did something totally different and talked to some guests and so on. And it just sort of struck me that, you know, anyone watching Fox just did not see this pretty critical video that we were showing. And if you were watching Fox, you'd have potentially a very different view of what happened January 6th than, than everybody else. A uh, question comes from uh, Anna. What organizations are effective in countering extremism? Either of you, Congressman, you want to start on that? We've had hearings on this in the Judiciary Committee and very pleased that the Anti-Defamation League testified. They do a really good job of um, tracking and providing reports about extremism. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center has done some really good work on um, extremism as well. You're seeing more and more organizations and civil rights groups now taking this issue much more seriously. So in the Asian American community, you had an organization basically literally have to create an entire mechanism now to track hate crimes. It's called Stop AAPI Hate, and they've been tracking hate crimes against Asian Americans since the pandemic started. And unfortunately, there's been an explosion of approximately 150% increase in hate crimes against the Asian American community. So we're seeing essentially hate start to sort of show up in a lot of different places in ways that it didn't happen before. Professor, you have any particular groups to, to praise for countering extremism? I think that's a great list. And I would just add that those are the places where we do have the count that the FBI wasn't maintaining during some of those intervening years. I think that the ADL and the SPLC have both done incredibly important work over time to give us the archive that we do have about this movement's activity. Um, I think I would add that there are new local level de-radicalization and um, kind of misinformation targeted groups that are doing some great work. It depends on where you are. But I urge you to look around and see what's going on in your community if you're looking to support work. Um, the people that, that I hear from that work in de-radicalization, helping people um, not get into these groups and also helping them leave. Um, and it's worth remembering, um, you know, I, I think sometimes it's hard to extend a degree of empathy here, but, but it's worth remembering that some people in these movements are there because, for instance, their husband got really involved and this place had free childcare or um, a trusted family member um, brought them in one day and, and somebody did something nice and then all of a sudden here you are stuck. So there are a lot of people who want to leave and I think helping with that, that process can be a valuable place to put some resources to. Um, and then of course, I think misinformation, disinformation work has become really important, especially in the last few years um, because of what Congressman Liu has outlined. Well, and, and getting back to what I started with, some of the psychological issues at, at play with the military, I mean, we, we know there are many people who make a very intentional choice to join the military. It's a career move like anyone else would make, as you obviously did, Congressman, with your service in the Air Force. Um, but then there are other people who this may be kind of a, a default. They're scuffling around. The military is something that you know provides some kind of structure, as you were saying earlier. And so um, they do that because there really is not another plan. And I and I wonder for individuals like that, I know neither of you are psychologists, but your thought would in again a very small subset of those folks might be in there looking for something maybe more um, less defended against outlandish theories and and uh, blatantly racist appeals professor I mean I think part of what we're thinking about in that question is sort of the the the, the scholarship is very um, has not come down on any kind of consensus about this, but about paths to radicalization. In other words, can we predict who within a given circumstance is likely to become um, a violent actor or an insurrectionist or a bomber? Um, and, and the scholarship has really not persuasively answered this question. From a historical standpoint, what I see is that there are as many roots to extremism as there are extremists that we learn about after they do something. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that um, the psychological profile is the only way to, to sort of get at that. I, I wonder if 
we might also want to be thinking about um, the sort of The, the, well, okay, so then there's the question about why do these activists want to get into the armed forces? Um, because we've had reports now, both of people who are trying to enlist, get some training that they can use for their own purposes and then leave to go um, do their own nefarious activity. Um, in other countries, we've seen people use the armed forces as a way to rise to command in order to pose a different but very grave kind of security threat to the integrity of our armed forces. And I'm not an expert in either of those things, um, but I know that the DOD has been looking into both of those as areas of concern. Um, so I, I suppose that's the, the best answer I can give there. We have another good question. Um, is there a chance with a new administration and a new Justice Department that the tide may turn on white power movements and um, extreme, uh, uh, threats like this. Uh, Congressman, what do you think? Yes. Uh, so we do know that Attorney General Garland has said that um, prosecuting and going after those who participated in the January 6th insurrection is one of his top priorities. Uh, we know that the FBI director who has served under both the last administration as well as this administration continues to prioritize uh, white domestic extremist groups. And I just want people to sort of step back and think a little bit about what happened last year. Generally, incumbent presidents win, but the American people actually came out in overwhelming numbers, rose up and fired the former president who made a series of pretty racist statements over his four years. And also basically, in my opinion, uh, gave the green light to white supremacist groups. And the overwhelming majority of Americans came out and fired him. Um, so I do think we're seeing the country uh, trying to shift and go to a better place where we're going to focus on our better angels instead of um, some of our, our darker spheres. Well, and, and my sense is, and I'd be interested in what you think, Professor Ballou, that the January 6th insurrection and attack at the Capitol so shocked the senses of the majority of Americans that I can't help but think it also had some effect on the white power movement, especially since they did not achieve their goals, lives were lost, prosecutions are taking place. What do you see as the effect? Well, so here I am afraid I don't have quite as hopeful a view. Um, and it's because I think that they did achieve their goals in large part on January 6th. To be sure, um, the, the body count could have been much, much higher. But I think that the playbook for January 6th for white power activists um, is located in a novel called The Turner Diaries, which if you get curious after what I'm about to say, please don't go buy it new because the money still goes back to white nationalist groups. So please get a nice pirated PDF somewhere. You can hear that from me. Um, the, so the Turner Diaries is a 1978 novel that has staying power in this movement, not because it is a good novel, but because it provides a sort of lodestar for organizing cell style terrorism around particular objectives and provides a playbook for different kinds of um, attacks. So the Turner Diaries is kind of the map of something like the Oklahoma City bombing. It also features things like the um, mass hanging of all racial enemies, including Jewish people, uh, Congress people, academics, I mean, uh, uh, including all people in interracial relationships in something called the Day of the Rope. Um, and it includes mass attacks in many other places, like attacking the Pentagon with a megaton warhead, nuclear bomb warhead, um, bombing the South after force marching all people of color there, um, massive biological and chemical attacks on Africa and Asia with the goal of ensuring not only a white ethnostate, but an all white planet. So this is, I, I outline that just to emphasize that this is a profoundly violent book with sort of the most um, dramatic version of the fulfillment of this ideology. In the Turner Diaries, there is an attack on the Capitol building. Um, it is a mortar attack, meaning that someone is positioned and firing mortar grenade rounds, not grenades, mortars into the Capitol building in order to um, scare and injure people inside the building. Um, 
it is not a mass casualty attack. It is not imagined as a mass casualty attack. The attack on the Capitol and the Turner Diaries is supposed to be a show of force that is supposed to awaken other people to join the cause. Um, we know that people who attacked the Capitol building saw it that way because they immediately reached into um, Trump groups on Parler and Facebook and elsewhere before all of that got shut down in order to recruit and radicalize. We know that many people saw this as a victory. And we know that these activists aren't shy. They don't have a weak stomach for a victory when the rest of us don't like what has just happened. Militia group activity went up after the Oklahoma City bombing, not down. Um, so this has been, I think, in many measures, a successful event for these activists. We know they were thinking about the Turner Diaries because they erected a noose outside and, and talked about the Turner Diaries to journalists um, around January 6th. So given that, um, my, my concern is that this is not sort of the, culm, culm, the, the, the culmination of something, it's the beginning of something, it's the recruitment event. Um, and that the next thing in the playbook is mass casualty attacks, infrastructure attacks, um, bombings and poisonings and other kinds of things like this. So that's the concern. The good okay. news is, the good news is- I'll let you close on this because yeah. we're just about out of yeah, time. So <laughs> your closing statement, which it's great if you've got a, a bit of good news in this. Yeah, the good news is that I think that really the work that Congressman Liu is doing, and I can't thank you enough for this. This is a, a tireless battle to um, keep this story in our focus and to come to a, an agreement, a public narrative about what happened um, is just incredibly, incredibly important because a full understanding of what happened that day and what it meant is the, the starting point for all of the work that we have to do. All of these are good steps, but this is the beginning of confronting this problem. And there's a lot of work ahead. And I think the good news is that there are things that everybody listening right now can do. Listen to these stories, put them together, connect the dots, don't accept ideas of disconnected lone wolf attacks, um, and just try to keep this in the spotlight, talk about it, tweet about it. Um, all of that is really, really helpful. And keeping the spotlight on this um, has measurable effects for people working on the ground. Professor, thank you. Congressman Liu, your final thoughts on our topic. Well, uh, thank you again, Larry, for moderating uh, this panel. And thank you, Professor Ballou, for your uh, terrific research and really insightful comments. I just want to end uh, with some uh, words of hope. And just want you to think about uh, what our country went through, how we overcame this pandemic. We're now crushing the virus. America is reopening again. Um, but also about our institutions. So regardless of what you think yeah. about the Mueller report, we had an investigation led by a Republican during a time when Republicans controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. And that investigation of the Republican president was allowed to continue to its completion. That's pretty amazing. I don't think a lot of countries would have sustained that. And so we did. And it tells me that our institutions, though they were attacked, still remain strong. And now we have a new administration. Uh, we've got this um, jobs number, which is pretty amazing. We cut jobless claims in half. We now have more than two thirds of Americans who have gotten at least one shot of the vaccine. So we're gonna be back to normal much sooner rather than later. And the next time all of you do this, I look forward to doing it with all of you uh, in person. Thank you very much, Congressman Ted Liu. Thank you very much, Professor Kathleen Ballou. Great to talk with both of you this evening, even on what is a very, very difficult subject and, and difficult accounts to hear. I wanna express my appreciation again to judge and community advocates and my colleagues for getting to do this every week with such terrific guests, just like we had tonight. And you don't have to wait long just through the Independence Day weekend because next Wednesday, very same time, five o'clock Pacific time. It's going to be Congressman Jamie Raskin, the impeachment manager for the House, and noted Professor Rick Hassan. He's one of the leading election law authorities in the country. Uh, that'll be next Wednesday at five o'clock. Congressman Raskin and Professor Rick Hassan, thank you so much for joining us from all of us at America to Crossroads, from community advocates and judge. Thank you and have a very good Wednesday evening.